Year eight. Miss Street asked me to speak to you this week because she is engaged on something and I'll just hold the fort. This is Mr. Thomas. Um, I'm going to push through the end of chapter two, which you've been reading with her, and you're going to choose one of three tasks to answer. But let's uh, do some background reading and then read through the extract and make a few notes. You, I believe, have been taught what corrupt means. So uh, do you remember what corrupt means? Pause the video if you need more time. And, well, it's a state of moral decay or the idea of someone being spoiled, either physically or psycholog psychologically. And so how did Frankenstein's actions corrupt him? This is the scientist who, by the power of electricity and body parts, created a monster or a fiend. But how did Frankenstein's actions corrupt him? Well, let's consider the idea that he's making a human being, or he's making a creature that it was said only God had the power to do. Perhaps Frankenstein is being sinful by blaspheming, so he's corrupting his reputation in a way. Uh, he also has bad dreams on the night on which he makes the monster, suggesting that he's corrupted himself psychologically. Hubris, then. What is hubris? Do you remember that is? It's uh, misplaced. It's overconfidence. <clears throat> and how might hubris relate to the seven deadly sins? So if hubris is a, an overconfidence in your own abilities, which of these seven deadly sins does that reflect? Well, I would say pride in that you believe that you know better. Hubris actually relates to the Greek word hubris, which means uh, you are, you think that you can deny the gods. I'm just going to show you a picture of a chap called Creon here. He's an ancient Greek character from Greek tragedy, usually powerful men who end up upsetting the gods. Uh, the family tree you see above, Eteocles, Polynikes, Ismene and Antigone, they're brothers and sisters. And Antigone was engaged to one of Creon's sons. Uh, Polynikes, Creon ordered to be buried on a battlefield. So he ordered his son's girlfriend's brother to be buried, to be left on a battlefield to rot. The gods said that's an offensive thing to do souls uh, should be laid to rest by proper burial. Creon said, no, having none of that, I'm being, uh, he showed hubris. Uh, to cut a long story short, Antigone ended up killing herself, as did Creon's son in, in mourning for his fiancée. So Creon basically destroyed his family out of hubris and ends up blinding himself. Hedonism, then. This is a word that Henry Wooten uses later in the extract, as you probably read last week. Hedonism is a theory of conduct in which pleasure is the most significant criteria of worth. Basically, you're living for pleasure. And it takes its name from the Greek hedone, hedone which means pleasure. Hedonism, worth remembering. How could hedonism corrupt people then? Let's have an answer to that on paper. And how might decadent behavior link to the seven deadly sins? So, how you've looked at how hubris relates to the seven deadly sins. Same question again, really. How might decadent behavior link to the seven deadly sins? If you want a reminder of decadence, then it, one is coming up. Let me explain the format of the lesson. We are going to just cover a bit of revision. Then we're going to jump out of PowerPoint, PowerPoint, go into Word, make some notes together, and then I'll leave you with three questions of which you have to choose one. And I'll show you a couple of examples of how to answer them. So let's do some revision. So Miss S. 
told you about the aesthetic movement. This Oscar Wilde's mate at Oxford, one of the lecturers there, believed in art for art's sake and the life of sensation. This is one of the strands of the aesthetic movement. Basically, things should be pretty and every moment should be geared towards making your surroundings and yourself beautiful, sounding good, looking good. Um, yes. Um, there's another view of aestheticism. One of uh, Pater's rivals, John Ruskin, said beauty had to be allied with good. So uh, you, so the world, if you had an aesthetic experience, it had to be, it had to have some kind of moral purpose. It had to develop your spirit as well. So Oscar Wilde, he said with this novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, to develop the aesthetic movement. And he said, to be a work of art is the object of living. Wilde was actually in debt at Oxford University. He owed uh, five pounds to a jeweler because he was very interested in diamonds and, and rubies and so on. And he is renowned for a coat which looked like a, a cello. So he spent a lot of money on clothes. He's only about 23 years old when he had um, a 20 pounds debt for making what's called a super fancy Angora suit. So Oscar Wilde really puts into this book the idea that art is the object of life. You've looked at decadence already. It means decline, self-indulgent behavior. That's like, that means living for yourself, living to please yourself. Valuing artifice over nature, well, that's to say that rather than be a romantic poet and go into uh, um, the Lake District or for a walk on a wheel or in a, on along the beach, you'd prefer to have a picture of the same hanging on the wall of the artificial version. Mystery, I was delighted to hear that you learned fin de siècle, which meant the end of century. This is a poet called Verlaine who was writing in. 1890s. Uh, here's my favourite photograph of him uh, sat beside, behind a, a cup of absinthe. But fin de siècle was a period of generous degeneracy. He wrote a book, a poem, sorry, called Longueur. And Longueur gives us the word language. So here's some key words you need to understand before we start reading. Languid means having a disinclination for physical effort. I wouldn't say lazy. I would say that it means relaxed. So languid means relaxed or not really, not being a, not being a very physical or active person. Divine means godlike. Sovereignty, absolute rule, superficial, something existing at surface level, more basic. Um, so a superficial person is someone who might be obsessed by their appearance. Squander, Lord Henry says, don't squander your youth, don't waste it. Um, he says that unlike the laburnum, which is a flower, uh, a tree that has these golden shower-like flowers, um, youth only happens once, nature regenerates. Age, he says, makes us hideous or ugly, and thoughts Lord Henry says, can sear into you, so you can be burn, burned by age. So there's this running through this extract is this destructive, destructive impact of age. And there's a touch of laburnum down the bottom left. Um, I mentioned uh, fin de siècle and Verlaine. Here is his poet Longer. Remember, this gives us languid. Um, I should say that this poet is was one of the decadents as well. Uh, the translation, I'll just go straight to the translation, it says, ah, all is drunk, all eat, and nothing more to say, alone, vapid verse tosses in the fire. So at the end of the century, basically, when Dorian Gray was written, Vernon is saying, we're all drunk, we've had all the experience we've needed, there's nothing more to say, we're all corrupt. A vapid verse one tosses in the fire, Oscar Wilde returns to this image of fire, cleansing fire as well, and we'll touch on that shortly. Uh, well, yeah, I know you've studied this man's background. 
uh, he was, uh, well, he was um, very controversial, known as a dandy, um, known as uh, someone who could teach you to write uh, in, in a lot more style. Uh, he, he spoke and wrote in style. Dorian Gray was his only prose novel, uh, but more famous for his plays, perhaps. And being at the vanguard, so one of, he represented the aesthetic way of life, so the idea of developing your appearance and your wit, and uh, there it is. And it uh, has to be said that he um, was perhaps more famous for his uh, his private life, should we say. Um, he was, yeah, he was um, uh, homosexual and he was arrested for gross indecency because of his relationships with men. He spent two years in the clink in, in jail. Um, but he refers to all of these incidences cryptically in his novel. Okay, so we're going to shortly jump out of PowerPoint, read and annotate two sections. So if you could have your chapter twos ready, we're going to label examples in the margin of age and beauty, sensory language. So we're simply going to write these into the margin at the appropriate points. Uh, if you're confident enough of doing that, just um, head off. And... We need reference to the seven sins, the seven deadly sins. Um, what Miss Streets. Uh, pet concept. Uh, aestheticism, decadence, flowers being symbolic of youth and beauty. I think you've touched on the symbolist movement as well. Uh, so we're going to go from line 44, page two. So before I jump out of PowerPoint, the questions I need you to work on today, I've been asked to give you. So first, either write a summary of how Lord Henry feels about youth and beauty, or choose an important quotation and explain why it's important. Three, what's your opinion of what Lord Henry says? Uh, my apologies, about youth and beauty. Okay. Right. So let's jump out of PowerPoint now. Pen's ready. We jump over to Word leaping over to Word, leaping to page two. So uh, here we go, picture of Dorian Gray, chapter two. I've highlighted the words I want to talk you through in bowls, so just ignore the bowls for now. I put stars where I've made little. Uh, let's, let's read about 10 lines or so. Dorian Gray frowned and turned his head away. This is Dorian just being introduced to Lord Henry. Remember, Dorian is sitting for a painting of him painted by his friend Basil. Dorian Gray frowned and turned his head away. He couldn't help liking the tall, graceful young man who was standing behind him, Lord Henry in other words. His romantic olive-coloured face and worn expression interested him. There was something in his low, languid voice that was absolutely fascinating. His cool, white, flower-like hands even had a curious charm. They moved as he spoke like music, and he seemed to have a language of their own, but he felt afraid of him and ashamed of being afraid. Why had it been left for a stranger to reveal him to himself? He had known Basil Hallward for months, but the friendship between them never altered him. Suddenly there had come someone across his life who seemed to have disclosed to him life's mystery, and yet, what was there to be afraid of? He was not a schoolboy or a girl. It was absurd to be frightened. Let's go and sit in the shade, said Lord Henry. Parker has brought out the drinks, and if you stay any longer in this glare, you'll be quite spoiled, and Basil would never paint you again. You really must not allow yourself to become sunburnt. It would be unbecoming. What can it matter, cried Dorian Gray, laughing as he sat down on the seat at the end of the garden. It would matter everything to you, Mr. Gray. Why? Because you have the most marvellous youth, and youth is the one thing worth having. I don't feel that, Lord Henry. 
No, you don't feel it now. Someday, when you are old, wrinkled, and ugly, when thought has seared your forehead with its lines of passion branded your lips with its hideous fires, you will feel it terribly. Okay, we'll stop there because I want to read that in the second part of the lesson. Um, okay, so let's look at the low language voice and make a comment. So if we could highlight low language voice. Um, well, language is what's called sensory language. It means it gives you feeling of it it stimulates the emotions in some way so he has a low relaxed voice that has that was absolutely fascinating he's cool white flower like hands let's uh, say flower flower like hands and make a comment this is an example of flowers symbolic of youth and beauty I find that Lord Henry seems older than he is in this uh, novel. He is a graceful young man at the moment. He spoke like music. Now, music is a euphemism for, well, an intimate relationship, could we say. Now, as I mentioned, Oscar Wilde spent some time in prison for indecency. In, he mentions in this same novel later on, music brought him and Dorian Gray together. He's talking in this case about somebody else. And then he says, he's actually somebody he tries to blackmail later on. And he says for 18 months, their intimacy lasted. Intimacy, music, Dorian says, we were friends once, Alan, later on. So he doesn't refer to a, um, an amorous relationship directly because it would have been illegal in those days. But music is a what we call a euphemism, which is a way of ex um, explaining a vulgar expression. So I'm going to say it's it's a euphemism is a polite way of explaining a vulgar expression. Let's just add euphemism here and say it's the seven sins. Okay. Um, I know it's a little quicker to annotate on with a visualizer and it is. I think in the street had a had some paper that I, I just simply don't have that technology. Apologies. Um, so Dorian feels afraid and ashamed of being afraid. This is a time where a relationship with man, of course, would have to be kept secret. Um, it has to be referred to as a fascination instead. So again, let's call this a reference to the seven sins. Why it being left for a strange to reveal itself to him? Now, uh, we talk about Basil, Lord Henry, revealing life's mystery. Now, there's this philosophical angle to Dorian Gray, suggesting that people could think about making art of their lives, making their own, turning life into arts. Um, that, what is the secret? of life. Lord Henry says later on, uh, life, art to us, is simply a method of pro procuring extraordinary sensations. So live for sensation is the idea of Lord Henry. And who does that remind us of? Pater or Ruskin? Yes, it was Pater, the idea of art for art's sake. Um, make a note of aestheticism and decadence. But 
what I need you to do is highlight the words I'm highlighting and add the same comments I'm adding. I down to the last paragraph. Reading from line 60, I think. 60. Yeah, line 60. So the second half of the lesson then, we're reading, annotating line 60 onwards. No, you don't feel it now. Someday when you're old and wrinkled and ugly, when you when thought has seared your forehead with its lines and passion branded your lips with its hideous fires, you will feel it. You will feel it terribly. Now, wherever you go, you charm the world. Will it always be so? You have wonderfully beautiful face, Mr. Gray. Don't frown. You have. And beauty is a form of genius. It's higher indeed than genius. Because it needs no explanation. It's through the great facts of the world, like sunlight or springtime or reflection in dark water, that silver shell we call the moon. It cannot be questioned. It has divine right of sovereignty. It makes princes of those who have it. Uh, prince of those who have it. Uh, later on, Dorian Gray is obsessed with characters from the literature who are beautiful and admired for their beauty. He has a corridor in his one of his homes, one of his homes of these mythological and uh, legendary characters who look good and have profited from their looks. You smile, ah, when you've lost it, you won't smile. People say sometimes that beauty is only superficial. That may be so, but at least it is not so superficial as thought is. To me, beauty is the wonder of wonders. It's only shallow people who do not judge by appearances. <clears throat> the true mystery of the world is the visible. This is pure patriotism. But the true mystery of the world is the visible, not the invisible. Yes, Mr. Gray, the gods have been good to you, but what the gods give, they quickly take away. You have only a few years in which to live really perfectly and fully. When your youth goes, your beauty will go with it, and then you'll suddenly discover there are no triumphs left for you. I love that quotation. I wrote a story once. I quoted this. It's about a man who uh, claims his own inheritance and has his body frozen for a few, uh, few years. Or have to content yourself with those mean triumphs that the memory of your past will make more bitter than defeat. Every month as it wanes brings you nearer to something dreadful, something dreadful meaning death. Time is jealous of you and wars against your lilies and your roses. You'll become sallow, which means pale, and hollow-cheeked and dull-eyed. You will suffer horribly. Ah, realise your youth while you have it. Don't squander the gold of your days. Look at how he presents um, youth as, a, as gold, something precious. Listening, I should have highlighted that really. Listening to the tedious, trying to improve the hopeless failure or giving away your life to the ignorant, the common, the vulgar. These are the sickly aims, the false ideals of our age. Live, live the wonderful life that's in you. And not, let nothing be lost upon you. By living, he says, he's, he's meaning get drunk, have affairs, have flirtations, live that uh, naughty life that's illegal and um, and spend all the money you want. Be always searching for new sensations. Be afraid of nothing. A new hedonism that is what our century wants. It might be its visible symbol. With your personality, there's nothing you could not do. The world belongs to you for a season. The moment I met you, I saw that you were quite unconscious of what you really are, of what you really might be. There was so much in you that charmed me that I felt I must tell you something about yourself. I thought how tragic it would be if you were wasted, for there is such a little time your youth will last, such a little time. And hill flowers wither, but they blossom again. And I'll just fly down to the last line. Youth, youth, there's absolutely nothing in the world but youth. Now, as I slowly make my way back up to line 60 for our notes, that Oscar Wilde's got the idea. His, does anyone remember what the name of the painter is called? Remember? Basil, Basil Horwood. Wilde himself was actually painted by a painter called Basil Hall. So Oscar Wilde pays these homages to people in his life who made an impact on him. He calls Basil Hallwood, he named Basil Hallwood after Basil Hall. And in real life, Basil Hall showed him the painting and said, Oscar, this painting makes you look so good. It's a pity you're going to get older. And the painting won't. And then Oscar Wilde said worse to the effect that if only it were the other way around, 
The painting will never grow older, and I shall. If only it was the other way. There, my friends, is the origin of the picture of Dorian Gray, this great, great novel. Um, I could go on, but let's just make some notes now. So wrinkles, this is age and youth. Age and beauty, I should say. Hideous fires, this is the idea. Oscar Wilde returns to this idea of things being cleansed by fire. Dorian Gray has to dispose of something in the fire later in the novel, no spoilers. But it's the idea that passion or sin can be etched into your face. Hideous fires. Sin, says Basil later, is something that writes itself across a man's face. It cannot be concealed. So, there's a hint of the seven sins. Age. Is it age and beauty? The idea that age and guilt makes you look hideous as you grow older. Uh, beauty is a form of genius. It's higher indeed than genius. Beauty is a form of genius. Higher indeed than genius. So, let's highlight this entire section, actually and say this is the philosophy of Walter Pater, the aesthetic, aestheticism. So we'll call this aestheticism. Aestheticism or decadence. Okay. Uh, beauty is genius. It's higher and deep than genius. It's for beauty. Uh, now, if you are old, Lord Henry, the memory of your past will make you bitter, jealous of your own self. So this is another reference to age and beauty. Certainly to age, you can envy your own youth if you don't live it properly. It's merely a theory. This book isn't a, doesn't really instruct you to behave badly. There is a consequence to it. In fact, Dorian has to, it's said, well, I that's coming up later. Uh, every month it wanes, it brings you nearer to something dreadful. The something dreadful is an old and decrepit, um, withered life. Really frowning on the idea of getting old. Time is jealous of you and wars against your lilies of roses. This is the idea. Oscar Wilde loved flowers. In fact, he spent quite a lot of money on decorating his rooms at Oxford with flowers, possibly lilies actually. And he returns to flowers often in this novel, you've probably noticed, but here they're symbolic. Uh, flowers symbolic of youth. What are we saying? Youth and beauty. Wars against your lilies and your roses. Um, let nothing be lost in you. Be always searching for new sensations. Who said that earlier? Who said that the idea of life is sensation? Peter. It's certainly the aesthetic idea. It's the idea of hedonism, decadence, which is often linked to aestheticism. Let's actually say aestheticism difficult to spell that. It's that aestheticism, decadence, and hedonism. Live for pleasure, live for feeling. A new hedonism is that what our century wants. Uh, see above. The common hill flowers wither, but they blossom again. Uh, so Wild here is using flowers of sim being, as being symbolic of youth. Nature has a second youth and a third, if you like, but we only have one. So let's say flowers, symbolic. Of youth and beauty. The burnham will be as yellow. Thank you. Uh, the laburnum will be as yellow next June as it is now. Do we remember what laburnum is? Yep, it's yellow. Um, interestingly, this kind of yellow is symbolic, I think, because he refers to. You may have picked up that Henry Dorian Gray has. Henry has a copy of what's called the Yellow Book. Which is which represents a famous aesthetic novel, 
chapter called Aribourg, which is written about somebody who becomes stressed out in town and says, I'm fed up with this. I'm going to buy myself a house and fill it with beautiful things. So it's the color of yellow. Uh, the color yellow is somehow symbolic. Um, OK, so let's jump back over to PowerPoint and leave you with the questions again. I'll give you a couple of examples. My goodness, this is a long lesson. Um, where will we turn? No, no, no. This will do. So, either write a summary of how Lord Henry feels about youth and beauty, choose an important quotation, explain why it's important. What's your op opinion of what Lord Henry says about youth and beauty? I think I have a model of what he could say to the first. So, a summary of how Lord Henry feels about youth and beauty. Uh, Lord Henry feels that youth has first section, Lord Henry feels that youth is attractive. For example, he says that when Dorian's old, he will be wrinkled. The adjective shows effectively how Lord Henry believes age is linked to decay. Uh, yes, so you could also say Lord Henry feels that youth is exciting. Uh, Lord Henry feels that beauty is linked to flowers, something like that. Let's look at the second. Choose an important quotation, explain why it's important. Well, imagine you're answering this one instead. I've chosen uh, the quotation, hill flowers wither, but they blossom again. This is important because it shows how nature can revive an individual, the feeling of rebirth and regeneration. This is more of a Ruskin point of view. Oscar Wilde used to build roads for Ruskin in his holidays at Oxford. Ruskin was one of the lecturers and Ruskin thought that beauty can have a moral purpose because creating a road, a beautiful road, would help you uh, help improve your mind somehow. Um, what's your opinion of what Lord Henry says about youth and beauty? Well, you could have a positive or a negative one, really. It's up to you. In my opinion, Lord Henry, if you yeah, if you don't have an opinion, I, I could give you one here. In my opinion, Lord Henry reflects Oscar Wilde's philosophy that to be a work of art is the object of life. For example, he says, be a flower, be pretty, enjoy your youth, perhaps. In my, or you could say, in my opinion, Lord Henry reflects a dangerously decadent attitude of a fan de siècle personality. For example, well, you find a quotation that suggests he is being a bad influence on the reader of Dorian Gray. So interesting, interesting characters emerging. Don't quite know who is going to be the most positive influence on reading yet. Um, finally, what quotation shows Sir Henry is encouraging a new hedonism? Good. So uh, I'll leave you with those choice of three questions and I talk to you again soon.